Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Juliet S. Kono Lee <laughs> is the author of several books, Hilo Rains, uh, Tsunami Years, Ho'olu'u Park and the Pepsodent Smile, The Bravest Opihi, and Anshu, a novel. She has appeared in many anthologies and collections and is the recipient of several awards, including the Elliott Cades Award for Literature the American Japanese National Literary Award, and the Hawaii Award for Literature. She's retired and lives with her husband in Honolulu. And also, she's, uh, she's retired from Leeward Community College, so we're happy to have her back and visit our campus again. So thank you so much, Juliet. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, thank you very much for um, asking me to, be, uh, to come to speak to you. I started writing about um, when I was in my 30s, and um, um, I didn't go to school until I was 44. I was a uh, dropout of college for several times. I mean, I didn't do very well. Then, um, all of a sudden, I started writing, and when I was working at the police department, and um, I started writing poems during the night shift where I was a police dispatcher. And um, I wrote my first book, Hilo Rains, at that time. So um, I will read a little bit from Kilo rains. Oh, before I go on, I want everybody should read this book, What We Must Remember About the Massey Case. If, you've, if you're living in Hawaii, you should read about what happened to um, this case. It happened a long time ago, but it's relevant today because it touches upon like the Ferguson case and you know all the shootings that we've been having. And so um, check us out on this. Anne is in it, myself, and two other women, OK? OK. I was born what you call a blackout baby. During the war, we had a blackout. And so I was born in 1943 when um, the lights all would go out in, during the evening, I mean, during the night. And so I wrote a poem about it. And it's called Blackout Baby. You know, some of these poems have the F word, and some of these poems have, is not politically correct sometimes. So I hope it's OK. OK? And I have some sex poems. They're not porno, porno, however. I'd like to write porno. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but anyway, blackout baby. The Japs, my mysterious kin, have just bombed Pearl Harbor. Each night thereafter, each home is allowed one blackened light. Windows are tarred and cracks under doors are stuffed with rags, chastising the light that dares to wander. The block wardens come drawn, drawn like termites to light. Violators are startled by the bang on the door, and if you are a Jap, you have to be careful. They could send you to internment camp somewhere in Colorado. One night, a woman labors in the heat of the blackout light. Into this darkness, a child is born. It is I, a blackout baby, nosing in the darkness with heavy eyes, a yellow belly filled with a livid cry. OK, so we're a part of the plantation. You know, I grew up in the plantation during the plantation time. And we were very poor, but we used to go fishing all the time. 
and this is called Pearls, and it's about my mother. I hung my face like a moon over the galvanized kitchen sink to watch mother clean the ahole hole father caught while pole fishing off Suisan, a sampan dock in Waikea village. She scaled the fish with a spoon, a scale or two, spiraling into the air like snowflakes. She slit the silver bellies like a surgeon, her finger fingers shriveled like dates, disappearing into the cavities. In one pole, she had the gills and guts out intact. Looking my way, she shook her head at her, my scale-flecked face as she washed as she washed each fish out. The luminous fish made a neat row on the cutting board. They were then salted, dredged in flour, and pan-fried in oil. She tried to teach me how to eat these fish. I watched her work her chopsticks, picking bones clean of white meat. I watched and tried to imitate. I will never acquire the knack of eating fish especially the fish head, the way she eats it, having no qualms about sucking out the brains or the gelatinous eyes with a slurp and a plopping from her mouth into a cupped hand, the eyeballs like pearls. Okay, and here's my sex poem. I started, but I didn't finish earlier. Um, I was doing um, some sound testing with the guys here. And if you don't catch it, that's okay. <laughs> okay, sashimi. Um, daikon, I, I'm sure you know what daikon is, right? It's that white radish. And chiso is uh, beefsteak le leaves, and um, it has that medicinal good taste, right? You call eating sashimi primitive. I slice pieces from a slab of my favorite fish, a Buddha shibi from Kekaliki Market. Upon a blue plate on a bed of shredded daikon and chiso leaves, I fashion thin red slivers of raw fish into a pinwheel. In the center of this wheel, I place a dollop of wasabi mustard into a flour cup cut from a carrot. I dissolve the pungent must mustard into the shoyu sauce, the aroma ex exciting my ancestors. They dance on my tongue. I pierce a slice of fish with my chopstick, dip it into the sauce. I close my eyes. I let the smooth fish slide over my teeth, my tongue, then swim down my gullet. I chase this fish with a mouthful of hot rice, some green tea, and smack my lips in ancient noises of satisfaction. I take another piece. Looking up, I toast you with this trembling delicacy. Soon you will come to appreciate the years behind my palate. And I am patient, as all love is patient, for you will learn, as you once learned with women, to close your eyes and take flesh to mouth. You have to clap. <laughs> no, no, I'm only teasing. But that's my sex poem. <laughs> I have many sex poems, but I'm not going to read all of them in here. <laughs> OK, um, Anne has been telling me that you read some tsunami poems in Gila Rains, yeah? I'm not going to read the ones in here, but there's one I'm going to read called Schoolboy from Up Mauka, and it's in your book on page 68 if you wish to follow. Okay. Schoolboy from Up Mauka. 21 students and teachers at Lapahoi Hoi School were killed in the tsunami of 1946. And I'm talking to this schoolboy. You ran outdoors to look at the receding sea. Open and bare, 
It was as if the tale of the five Chinese brothers had come true, the story your teacher had read to you. Somewhere on the other side of the ocean, the first Chinese brother had drunk all the water. And here, on this peninsula, how everything glittered. Red stars, black sea urchins, pink anemones. With pants rolled high, shirt tucked in at the waist, you walked into shallow water and picked up the red, gold, and silver fish. Pa pio, veke avail veil. Fish for a good boy to take home, fish for supper. Look, look, you yelled to everyone, pointing at your prizes. A sudden roar. As in the story, the first Chinese brother who could no longer hold the water let it rush out and into our side of the world. If I could, I'd have stretched my legs into stilts, like the third Chinese brother, and plucked you from the sea. You dropped the colors from your hands. You moved up to face the wave. And in your wonder, all you could do was gape and point at what curled magnificently above you. And so, you know what happened to him, right? And I use the tsunami as a metaphor for womanhood. So I wrote a poem about womanhood. When I was three, a tsunami hit town. Daddy, daddy, save me. Don't let me drown. He saved me and my common type dolls. When I was 16, another tsunami hit town. I cried to my daddy, 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 please save me. Don't let me drown. But he let go of my hand. I still dance to what broke on my life. And this is sort of like a sex poem, too, but I'm talking about the tongue on page 118. Tongue. Oh, let me explain something. My mother used to use her tongue for all kinds of things, and so uh, I'm sort of following this. But then there's a twist at the end, so if you catch it, that's good. Tongue. Dust flew into my eye. My mother took my face into her hands like a melon, came at me with her tongue, and placed her lips around my eye. It looked as if she were sucking out my eyeball, the way she sucks out fish eyes to eat. She swirled her tongue and cleansed my eye of its irritant. Honeycomb of lungs, sticky with infection, held me to the sick beds for days. She placed her mouth over my nose and sucked the green muck as if she were slurping noodles. Her tongue helped clear my blocked nasal passages and heaved my wheezing out like bath water. After a walk in the cane fields, a bee in the ear had me spinning like a top. I banged into the wash buckets, gate, clothesline, zigzagged like a drunk or someone blind. Mother grasped my hands and secured me between her legs and came down on my ear with her tongue. She slid the tip in and left it there. Without a flinch, she retracted her tongue with a bee curled on its tip. My lips on your lips, my lips holding your tongue, a learned truth. Okay. So I think um, I'll read some. I'm going to read some um, drug poems. And um, since we do have a big trouble, I mean, a big problem in America about drugs. And, um, and it's a, this is about my son. Oh, 
before I go on, I'm going to read another poem called A Scolding from My Father. When I was growing up, I always told my father, oh, I hate, I don't want to be Japanese. I want to be Haole, or I want to be Chinese because they get plenty of money. I wanted to be Hawaiian because I wanted to dance Naisula. But this is what my father said to me. What kind of Japanese you? Nothing more worse in this world than one Japanese who like be something he not. No matter how much you like, no can. No can be howly. Who the girl? You know the Michael girl, the doc doctor's daughter, good looking. Live in the big house while Luca drive. Big eyes, nice car, blonde hair. You like talk like one howly? You like big eyes? You try live their house. No can be Chinese, rich, Wong family rich. Daughter go Honolulu, dorm at Punahou. We no more their kind money. Me, I only want mechanic. Your mother baker too at Waikawaina Elementary School cafeteria. And no can be Hawaiian, like Kaylee family daughter. You know which one, the smart one. Good hula dancer, fast swimmer, going mainland. You like dance like her? Nice nose too, she gets some tall. You like one nose like her? You dreaming girl. Come from your mother's side. You want flat nose Japanese because your mother get flat nose. So why you like act different for? Why you like be something you're not? You no more shame or what? Eh, you know figure too that maybe these guys they don't like you suck around them. And that was my father's scolding. Um, but I'm going to talk about, mainly about drugs. Um, my son at 16 was diagnosed as a schiz schizophrenic paranoid. And he was all over the place. We couldn't, we couldn't handle him, so most of the time he lived on the streets. And um, we tried to get him to take medication and stuff like that, but it was really hard. Um, and so I wrote a poem called Homeless. My son lives on the streets. We don't see each other much. Like a mother who puts white lilies on the headstone of a dead child, I put money into his bank account, clothes into easy access storage, and pretend he's far away at a boarding school or in a foreign country. Nights I dream fairy tales about him. I dream he becomes a prince, scholar, a warrior who rescues me from sorrow the way he rescued me when he was a child and said, Mommy, don't cry, and brought tea into the room of his father's acrimony. Brave, standing tall in the fi forest fire of his father's scorn. I wake to the empty sound of wind in the trees. He says he wants to live with me. I say I can't live with him, boy whose words crash like branches in a rainstorm. Nothing can hold him in, the walls of a house too thin. Back home, I had seen the steady hard so you don't become like them, street bums on Mamo Street, and he's like them. These days, in order to catch a glimpse of him, I circle the city. One day, I see him on his bike. People give him wide berth, the same way birds avoid power lines, oncoming cars or trees. I park on a side street. Wild-eyed, he flies the block as if in a holding pattern. Not of my body, not of my hopes, he homes in on what can't be given or taken away. Um, I'm going on to, I'm sorry, page 145. Um, he tried to uh, uh, commit suicide soon after, and um, um, they put him in Kaneohe State Hospital. We had a hospital for the mentally ill until the laws changed and we could no longer keep 
mentally ill people in the hospital. So this was under the administration, I think, on, under John Kennedy. But after that, everybody was on the streets. And we say, what, well, how come we can't do anything about them? You know, this was, to me, Kaneohe State Hospital was good for him. He got his medications, he got, you know, he got better. But anyway, this is during the time he was in the hospital. And this is called Sun After the Attempt. And you will notice if, um, I, are you folks in the creative writing class? It's a sonnet, what I call a pseudo sonnet, and it has 14 lines, yeah. The sun dusts the nape of my neck hotly. Behind us, the deep pleated ko'olau rise. I perspire, but you're cold in heavy robes, sandals slapping as you pace. Our eyes meet where I sit on a brand, bench. You turn, size me up, then point like some wild prophet and ask. Grandma Lee has Alzheimer's. When she dies, will she be as she was before the mask? The paraplegic, will he be able to walk, to pick flowers again? You know what it means to be alive, stable. When we die, we die perfect don't we? You take silence as a scent. Mom, so tell me, why do you and your miserable gods stop me? So um, he's still in Kaneohe State Hospital, but he was getting better. And they put red and or green gowns on patients um, especially for those who try to run away, and he's always trying to run away from, and they called them bolters. This is called encouragement. A day of encouragement, oh, page 146. Okay. A day of encouragement. You shuffle toward me in your bright green and red hospital gown especially for bolters. Your face, morning moon pale, your eyes, sea calm. Drugged, you say it's like pulling water, limp and heavy. Your days, the stillness of ocean pools. Once more, a sleepy, thumb-sucking child hanging onto the arm of my voice to be saved. You ask you ask for some Snickers, sushi, and heavy metal rock magazines. Tears start falling. They leap off a half smile like fish into the ache of my heart. You get up, walk away. How lonely you look, wrapped around the watery voices you hear in your head. Okay, so I'm going to change to bird 150. Very often, mentally ill people will self-medicate, and that's what happened to him. You know, he started smoking a lot of pot. That didn't help because it depresses you anyway. Pot depresses you. Um, he was under a dual diagnosis prob uh, program because he was what you call a po polymorphous user and drug user. A uh, polymorphous drug user is somebody who uses anything you know, meth, cocaine, heroin, you tell them. I mean, you know, I would ask him and he would tell me all the drugs, the different drugs he'd been using. Crazy, I know, but um, that's the way it was. And finally he went into, um, he felt so bad that he went to the hospital. And this is called Bird, page 150. Feathers. My son was c covered with feathers everywhere, head to toe, hair, ears, lashes, brows, clothes, thin as a quill, light as down. He looked more like a bird than anything human when he materialized, ruffled and nervous, 
at the door of the hospital. Lured by the flight of himself to where birds by instinct survive, he pushed himself into a crawl space, a rafter in the city, to lay down and die among the roosting spotted doves and city's pigeons. All he could hear were the avian hoop and throated whir of the nesting birds. At the last moment, what impressed a plume of hope, the desire to live, to pick himself up and walk into an emergency room? Before this, where did his cries go? And how was a mother to hear, to know? Bird around my neck, son who flew out of my hands in the distance of his agony and mine, not shortened by faith or love or the stepping of the birds across his chest, between his arms and legs in a song and dance, the scattering of crumbs, twigs, and leavings. Um, page 152, this, this poem is called Royally Pissed. And um, he kind of fell, fell into a semi-coma. Uh, he had a, they think he had a stroke. And so that's, you know, drugs age you, make you old and ugly and skinny like an old man. So he was, um, he was 27 but he looked very old. And the nurse said, he's still here so he can hear. He might not be able to speak or anything, but the last um, sense usually is the hearing, so you know, talk to him. And this is called royally pissed. Talk to him, he's still here. I know these things pronounces the nurse in a dispensation of her experience, years of watching the dying die. The soul hangs around for a while. But what can I say to you, that I'm royally pissed, that I'm madder than hell at you? Goddamn kid, how dare you do the right things at the end, and that it all came too late? I want to slap you back to life, Scream and beat the drum of your chest with my fists. Howl in the strange, hollow animal cry of the crazed dog that bays at the moon behind the old mountain house, then cuts loose across the fields and streams, fanning water high in its wake, the droplets caught in the moonlight and flung into a hive of stars. Forgive my crown of anger. Deliver me from this fucking pain. Okay, page 154. Usually in a family with drug problems or alcoholism, um, there's always somebody who's there, who, you know, helps around, is um, um, sort of the gatherer of all this stuff around them. And this happened to be my oldest son, and it's called Late for Darius. He was always his brother's keeper in a way. When, when I sort of, oh, I told my younger son, oh, hell with you. I can't cope with all this calling and asking for money and money, money, always sick. Um, police calls, the, you know, all these things. They really have problems. Too much drugs. Plus he's, you know, hearing voices and all kinds of stuff. Late for Darius. We called him Skinny Brother. Skinny Brother leans his tree form in the doorway of your hospital room, the smell of the flowers too white and sweet for what branches into his fears. It's two in the morning. His night aches for sleep, but he can't put you to rest. His mind pressed into the days we wait for you to die. 
stick arms and leg shadows across your body. How he doing, okay, he asks. All his life, your brother's worried about you. He still worries. From when you are a young kid, he's been tied to your wrist of hurt, picking you up from the hospitals, driving you home. How your impatience whacked him hard in the gut. Hurry up, every time he was late. But he'd do it over again in a minute. He'd go out and break his back for you. Far better to have you alive, give anything to hear you say once more, eh, where you was. Um, the next page, 156, he finally fell into, he had an aneurysm. And so the doctor said he has, you know, he's going to die. We d they didn't know how long he was going to die. I mean, he was going to be alive. So, um, uh, you know, we all sort of kept a vigil. And this is called Nest. I tightened the scarf around my neck, gripped my black coat to resist the night's crazy wind, the agonized air, the whip of the branches. Piling pillows and blankets around me, I build a nest on a rollaway next to your bed. Feeding tubes and ivy lines offer a covering. Carrying its supply of air, its smoke wings of oxygen, your ventilator chugs uphill like a train. Excuse me. Into the broken wings of your lungs and departs with your memory of what it is to be alive. Live, live. I agree. Pull the plug. What does this have to do with the heart? Now it's just a matter of time. A weed and a sidewalk crack. A gold guitar. Tonight, hovering over you, I'm a new mother. I listen to you breathe the same way I listened when you were a child, and I couldn't sleep in the fear of such a miracle. My ears to your life. I watch for the slightest change, each breath's soft and shallow retreat, and your life goes, I'm sorry, and your life goes scattering. Son who leaned too far out of the window, kicked you, kicked shoes on the porch. I'm sorry, I can't now uh, finish the last. I'm sorry. I've had this cough for a long time. So I'm going to start from page 157 at the bottom. And your life goes scattering. Son who leaned too far out of the window, kicked shoes on the porch. You who wanted more than just a breath of fresh air. You thought you could fly. And um, so the doctor said, you're going to have, um, there are two things to do. You can take him to the, um, you can take everything off and let him go, or, or you can put him on a vent ventilator, then they would put him in the nursing home because they can't keep him in the hospital. So I decided, oh, to let him go. And, um, but, but, he wouldn't die. I mean, he was breathing on his own, and you know, he just stayed like that for about three days. And the doctor said, "Well, we're going to have to move him. Whatever you know, the case is, he's going to have to go to the nursing home." So I said, "Oh, you know, we just gotta do what we gotta do." So the day before. Um, 
um, he was supposed to go, this nurse came up to me and she said, you gotta give him permission, you know, you have to tell him to die. Sometimes you just gotta let him go. So I wrote this poem called The Permission on page 161. I hope I can, my voice is better. The permission. My son is lying like a bridge, spanning himself from this life into another. We will take down the scaffolding that breathes for him, each breath a step closer to where he will arrive. Hands raised, the nurse snaps the latex gloves over her hands and unplugs the ventilator. His mouth falls open and he takes and she takes the tubes and pulls them out of his throat, feeding tube from his nose, IV from his arm. She leaves the oxygen in for comfort, the last suspension to his life. His head rolls back on the pillow, slack from pain and tension, his eyes open and tears roll down his face. I hold his hand and wipe his forehead for the things I couldn't do to love him. You're almost there. He breathes on his own. It's pure reflex now. His breathing will slow down, they tell me, then fade. He goes on through the night into the next day. It will be nice where you go. I give him this permission of love to cross the bridge. I tell him to enter Kaiviki house. He doesn't have to take his shoes off or shake out his pockets filled with the summer he played in. And he didn't die, so I told my husband, you know, I'm going home. I'm going to take a bath. I'm going to eat something good. And I'm just going to, you know, maybe take a nap and come back. But it was in that short period of time he just decided he was going. So I wrote a poem about that, that incident, and it's called In a Rush. The day I wait for my son to die, oh, page 163. The day I wait for my son to die, it's as if we are down at the harbor, watching the ships go by, and the longshoremen cart pallets of ice cream, iceberg lettuce bananas, and mail across the wharf. Our last time together, we're made whole again, as in that perfect moment, mother and child. Child no one could have loved or wanted except me, his mother. Son brought to me in a blue blanket, face red and swollen as a wound, the day I tied on your first booty, booties. We'd grown apart since then, joined now in this pitiable end facing the ocean. All day, no change, pulse, respiration, same. I leave to eat the, dry, the meat dry as saltines, change my sandals, wash my face. And it is so like him to die without me there at his bedside. His death as impulsive as he had always been, with no bells or clamor of the triangle, as if he had suddenly seen a passing ship, wasn't about to miss it, got up and dove into the water to meet it, going out the same way he had come, in a rush, headlong, pushing through water without a clue, boarding pass or blessing. And so that ends the series of poems about, about him. So you can, you can write a series of poems about an incident. Um, and we wrote a whole series of poems about this one incident. So, um, yeah. Uh, any questions? I want questions now. I have time for questions. If you want me to read some other poem or talk to, talk to me about the tsunami. Um, I know this is a downer, yeah? I'm sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs>
No, but no, no scare them. Talk to me. <laughs> oh, this is going to be on TV. Yeah. I mean, on YouTube. <laughs> uh -huh. And I'm talking, and he, you know. Yes. So, in the beginning, you told us that you dropped out of school many times, mm -hmm. and you kind of started like, writing poems. Mm -hmm. and what inspired you, and um, do you think schooling is necessary for us to write a poem or any kind of poem? I think, well, when I started writing poems, and I, I, um, you know, I had my first manuscript. It wasn't perfect, but I had my first manuscript. I realized while writing all these poems, I felt that um, I need. I didn't know very much about the world. I needed to expand my horizons and read more and learn more. I mean, I knew that, but when I was in high school. And I graduated high school. Um, I went to college the first year. I hated it. And so I dropped out. The next year I tried again. I hated it. I dropped out. I think I dropped out about four or five times. I don't know. Finally gave up. I said, I'm, not, I'm going to work. And so I went to work for the police department. And as I was writing, I thought, wow, I really cheated myself. So I went back to school at 40, at when, yeah, when I was 44, and graduated when I was 50 with my, yeah, with my BA and my MA. Yeah, but, and then I came here to teach. <laughs> so, anybody else? It's never too late, yes. I was inspired you what inspired me it's like flushing the toilet <laughs> a lavage <laughs> um, you know I just it seems like I just had things I wanted to say and even I'm lucky that some people were connected to some of the poems um, and I wanted to leave sort of like a legacy about my grandparents. And that came in soon. Um, he Lorraine's, but I also, you know, wanted to talk about the tsunami, the war, plantation life, um, and all that. Yeah. So it was better that I was older and writing because I knew what I wanted to write. Yeah. So. Good question. Yes? Um, so we're in an English class and we're trying to write about like, um, essays and poems. Um, do you have any advice for a stadium about writer's talk? You know, you just can't get, like, put it on words. You have a writer's block. Um, free write like crazy. Write anything. I mean, just doesn't have to make sense. Just you know, um, yeah, to me, free writing is, or write a journal, and don't worry about things like grammar or anything, you know? That you can fix later. But if you have your, get your ideas out, and sometimes when the ideas start coming out, you go, oh yeah, okay, I can think about that. But free writing is really great. So, yeah, good questions. Anybody else? Yes. Um, so, you talked about your son. How was like, the process of writing the poem about that? How was the process? Yeah, like, was it hard? No, it wasn't hard. Right after he died, I just sat, sat down one day and I just wrote. And about, I had about 20 poems and only about how many I have here. Not all of them were good, and many I threw away. So, but I think I have about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, about 15 poems out of that. So, and it came really fast. 
Um, and you know when you're in the hospital, sometimes it's good to be writing, you know? Yeah. But I'm crazy anyway. I don't sleep much. <laughs> That's why I got crazy kids. <laughs> um, I shouldn't say that. I have to be careful. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Any questions? Were you ever hesitant to share any of the personal stuff you wrote? Or would you, do you prefer to kind of share your story with other people? There's some, there's, many of them are not exactly true. I mean, there, as Lois Anya Manaka says, there's a kernel of truth, but we, as poets and as writers, we always make things metaphoric, we expand, we lie a lot. <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Well, she used to do things like that, yeah. And they used to suck, suck our noses. Now they have those, I don't know what they have for babies, but yeah. But at the time we were growing up, nobody had those things, yeah. So she used to just pull us and grab our grab us and suck our noses. <laughs> but it was so effective. To me, it's better than those things that parents use now. <laughs> um, no. And you said that if I were afraid... I know my auntie came up to me and said, you know, I'm never going to tell you a story again because I don't know what you're going to write about our family. And I said, well, um, and one aunt said, "I'm yeah, she didn't want to speak to me. For years she didn't speak to me because she said one of the stories, she said, that's about me. And I don't want, you know, I don't like it. But it was close to it, but not quite true. Yeah, experiment. I mean, you folks have Instagram and all these things um, out there, yeah? I mean, people get famous with their writing. Yeah, and so, you know, just, just try. You never know who you're going to meet up with or what's going to happen. It only needs, you only need persistence and, you know, um, a will, I guess, to do it. Yeah? Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, um, have a good, good college career, find good jobs. <laughs> you folks have more challenges than we, you know. So, take care. <laughs>